So today we're going to learn about impulse. And remember, if you are a CFISD student, you have your access to your textbook 24 seven if you log on to the website. And our textbook is physics principles and problems. And the stuff on impulse is on page 234 to 239 if you want another source to look at. So remember, momentum is a vector. Vectors means it can be positive or negative depending on which direction it's going. And it's different from inertia. Inertia is not a vector. Inertia is Inertia is not a vector. It doesn't have a direction. It's related directly to an object's mass. So the more mass an object has, the more inertia it's going to have. And it doesn't matter what the object is doing. Momentum is mass in motion. So if we are moving, then we can have momentum. So take a look at the two pictures of the freight trains. Both of them are very massive, so both of them have a lot of inertia. But the freight train that has uh, momentum is only the freight train that is moving. The freight train that is not moving has no momentum. And the faster an object goes, the more momentum it will have. So something that's very small could possibly have as much momentum as something big, so long as the small object is going very, very fast and the big object is going very, very slow. The way we calculate momentum is mass times velocity. So little p equals m times v. And if we want to change our momentum, a lot of the times, especially in high school physics, we aren't going to change the mass. So what we wind up doing is changing our velocity. But remember, if we are changing our velocity in a certain amount of time, we are doing what? change in velocity in a certain amount of time is an acceleration. So if we're changing our velocity, we're accelerating. If we're accelerating, what are we doing? What does our object, ha what happens to our object if we're accelerating? From Newton's second law, we know that if we have an acceleration, that means that a force is pushing or pulling on our object. So for mo change in momentum, we know two things. We know we might have some forces involved and we'll have some change in velocity involved. So impulse, is going to be the change in momentum of our object. So one way we can find the change in momentum, and remember the way we like to write change in physics is with the capital Greek letter delta, and it looks like a big triangle. So we have delta P for change in momentum, and that's going to be our impulse. If you're in a different class, um, sometimes uh, other textbooks or other teachers like to use a capital I or a capital J. I like to use delta P and it really depends on the teacher or the textbook. And remember, delta of anything means you take the final and subtract the initial. So the change in momentum would be the final momentum minus the initial momentum. So if we are thinking of impulse as changing the velocity, we get the equation 
delta P equals M delta V, or the impulse equals mass times the change in velocity. But because forces cause rates of change in velocity or accelerations, we also get impulse equals the average force applied to an object times the amount of time that that force is applied to an object. The common way, uh, uh, the common example is if we have a baseball bat and a baseball, the baseball comes in and encounters the baseball bat and the amount of time that the force is applied is only when the baseball and the baseball bat are touching each other. Really, there are two units for impulse. One unit comes from force times the amount of time that the force is applied, so we get newtons times seconds, but if we also think of it as change in momentum or momentum times the change in velocity, we can also have the unit of kilograms times meters per second. And those units, again, are kind of, both are acceptable and one teacher may have a preference for a certain unit. I don't in my class. And the last thing we need to think about I want, or the last thing I want to show before I move on is how we go from this equation of impulse back to this equation of impulse. So if we have, if we start with delta P impulse is force times delta T, starting with that equation, and then we can also use that force is mass times acceleration. So this, equa this next equation is the same thing. We still have force times the time it's applied. It's just now we have mass and acceleration. But what is an acceleration? An acceleration is a rate, which means if we have any kind of rate, means it is something that is changing every second. So any rate is something changing divided by time. So a rate of change in the velocity. So acceleration is rate of change of the velocity so it's how much the velocity changes every second. So we have mass times delta V divided by delta T times delta T. Delta T cancels. So we have impulse equals mass times the change in the velocity. I just wanted to show this to show how both of these equations are equivalent. Most of the time you won't have to derive anything. You won't have to prove, especially not in high school, that one is equivalent to the other, at least not in my high school class. Perhaps other high school classes at other schools. NBCLearn.com has a fantastic video on impulse and how force and time affect uh, the amount of impulse that an object has. I'll put a link in the description. Also, if you go to my classroom website, you'll be able to find the PowerPoint and it links, the, the link is active inside the PowerPoint itself. But I want you to take a look at this graph because in physics, we really love graphs. And I want you to think, how are we getting information about impulse from that graph? 
There are three ways to get information from graphs. The first is simply reading the graph. So for example, we have a velocity versus time graph. If we want to figure out the velocity, we would simply read it off of the graph. If we want to know how fast the object is moving at four seconds, all we have to do is look at four seconds and then read it off of the graph. And we know it is moving at 16 meters per second at four seconds. The second way of getting information from graphs is calculating the slope. Now, when you're calculating the slope, I don't want you to think of it as calculating slope. I want you to think of it as dividing two things. So in this case, on this graph, if we take velocity and divide it by time, especially if we are taking some average velocity or some velocity between some points, so let's pick some points. If we go for that chunk of time with this change in the velocity, what is change in velocity divided by the change in time? Like we said on one of the previous slides, that's the acceleration. So if we divide those two axes, we're getting the acceleration. But another way we can do get information off of these graphs is by calculating the area under the curve. I like to think of it more as the area between the graph line and the x-axis. So it would be something more like that. Or if we're picking a different, um, let's pick a different chunk. Let's pick the same chunk. So we have a chunk of time here, and it corresponds to a change in velocity over there. So our our graph would look like that. But really what this is, is multiplying. If you have, if you're trying to, if you have a certain shape and you multiply one side times the other side, that gets you the area. So if we multiply delta V and delta T, we actually get the displacement. So graphs become really powerful in physics because of how many ways we can get information from the graph. We can read the graph, we can calculate slope, and we can calculate area. And when you're looking at a graph, the first thing you should look at are those axes. You should look at the y-axis and the x-axis, and you should start thinking to yourself, how do those things combine in such a way that I can get more information from them? Do I need to just simply read the graph to solve my problem? Do I need to divide them in order to get an equation that I'm f familiar with? In that case, you would find the slope, or do I need to multiply these things together in order to find some information that I need? So let's take a look at this graph. What impulse was given to this object between six seconds and eight seconds? So from here to here, what is the impulse? Remember impulse, we have two ways of calculating it, M delta V or impulse F delta T. 
In this case, we have a force and time graph. So that corresponds to the second equation, impulse equals force times time. Those are multiplied together. So in this case, force times time, we're going to be multiplying on this graph. So between 6 and 8, we want the area that shape makes. So this, in this case, we take the area, and it's an area of a triangle. It's 1 half the base times the height. So this is 1 half 2 times 100. So our impulse is 100 kilograms times meters per second. So why can't we just take 100 and multiply it times 8, or 100 and multiply it times 2? If we did that, we would be saying that the force was 100 for the entire time that we're looking at. But the force changes in this case. So when the force changes, we have to be a little bit more careful. A lot of times a graph like this is going to, um, this looks like um, an impact of some sort. If something hits another object, it's going to kind of create a little peak like that. So it almost, almost looks like something that's bounced off of something else. In AP physics or in university-based university physics, we can calculate using integrals the area between that, but in high school physics, we just stick to simple shapes like triangles, rectangles, and trapezoids. So this first example, and all three of the examples on this slide, are, in my opinion, very easy. But physics teachers are very tricky, and there will be a couple tricks in amongst all the problems. But I have confidence in you. I think if you could pause me now, and you'd be able to solve all of them. But let's take a take a look first remember to draw a picture remember to check your units and remember to check the direction of things before you start calculating pause the video and see what you come up with okay so we have a 45 gram mass. In physics, we don't like to use grams. Grams are usually too small for what we're looking at. We use kilograms. So we have to make sure that that mass has the proper units. So we have a fairly small object traveling really fast, 42 meters per second. And this mass is 0 0.045 kilograms. What impulse is needed to stop that object? So just estimating beforehand which way would a force and an impulse have to go in order to get that object to stop. It needs to move in the opposite direction. So we should have some sort of estimate in our head that our answer should probably be negative. So let's calculate it. We know we're looking for impulse and we're given mass and velocities. 
So M delta V. And remember, delta V is VF minus VI. So we have 0 0.045 is our mass. VF is the final velocity. And it's coming to a stop. So its final velocity should be 0 meters per second. And the initial velocity is given as 42 meters per second. So the impulse should be negative 1.89 kilograms times meters per second. This example is not very tricky at all. I don't think you need any hints for this, but remember, draw your picture. Be careful of final and initial velocities, and then go ahead and solve. Okay, so in this case, we have, that's a hockey stick hitting a hockey puck and the hockey puck is 0.2 kilograms. It's initially at rest, but it gains some sort of velocity after the impulse is given. And the impulse is six newtons times seconds. So in this case, we're still going to use the same method to calculate impulse. 6 equals 0 0.2 VF minus VI was 0 because it's at rest. VF minus 0 is still VF. So we divide by, so that makes 6 equals 0.2 VF, divide by 0.2 on both sides, so VF equals 30 meters per second. Last one. For this one, it's really important to draw your picture. And I want you to think about time for a second before you solve it. Is time a vector or a scalar? Time is a scalar, which means it shouldn't be negative. It doesn't have a positive or negative direction. In high school physics, time is only ever going to go forward. The only time time would go backwards is if you're dealing with really some really crazy quantum particles, which you're not going to deal with in high school, even if you're taking an advanced physics class. So if you come up with an answer that has a negative time, that means that probably somewhere you either forgot about a negative or dropped a negative or something along those lines. So pause the video, see what you can do. And if you get a negative, try again, take a couple of looks at your answer and then unpause the video and take a look. Okay, so the first thing again is draw a picture. So we have an object of 600 kilograms, that's roughly person sized. A small person, but a person nonetheless. So I'm gonna draw a person. 60 kilograms moving 180 meters per second. So maybe they're skydiving, I don't know. And then we have a force of 500 newtons to stop that object or that person. 
Now, which way does the force need to go in order to get the person to stop? It should be the opposite direction of the way the person is going. So this is actually negative 540 newtons. And we kind of need to use both equations. We need both delta P equals M delta V, and we need delta P equals F delta T. And because these two things are both impulse, we can set them equal to each other. And then instead of having a two-step problem, first solving for impulse and then solving for time, we can have a one-step problem. Both ways are perfectly acceptable. If you did the two-step version, that's okay. So we have M delta V equals F delta T. So mass is 60. The velocity is final minus initial, so 0 minus 180 equals negative 540 times the amount of time that it takes for the object to stop. 60 times negative 180 is negative 10,800 and then we need to divide by negative 540 on both sides so we get T or delta T equals 20 seconds. That's the end of that. Our next video should include momentum at angles. So if we have a collision that's more similar to a pool table where the balls can go off at any different angle, we can figure out how to calculate the momentum and the velocity before and after the collision for that. Hopefully these don't seem too confusing and hopefully you got a couple uh, good hints about how to solve these problems and how to look at graphs. Don't forget to uh, join me in be, um, join me as part of the culture of discovery and don't forget to stay curious.